Okay, hello everybody. Um, I think most of you know Gladys, my guide dog. Um, she likes to be comfortable, so I'll just take care of her first. Okay, honey, down, down. So, um, while I speak, she might scratch herself, get up, or even bark in her sleep, so just so you know. Um, all right, um, Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that um, to be yourself in a world that's constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. But I will also say that it's a great challenge. I'm by nature not a challenge-loving sort of a person. Um, I'm quite content being one of the crowd as long as I'm allowed freedom for my thought and way to live my life. But when I'm judged by my disability, I no longer have the luxury of being a bystander. I was always fascinated by books and literature, and I wanted to become a librarian or a linguist so that I could always be close to them. But from my experience as a blind person, especially in the past few years, I came to realize that the social stigma and ignorance towards people with disabilities are too strong and too unjust for any person to enjoy life as a simple librarian. There are two primary choices in life, said um, Dr. Danis Waitley. To accept conditions as they exist, or to accept the responsibility of changing them. And when I think about all the difficulties I face every day, just trying to live my life, I truly believe that for any person with a disability who wants to lead a meaningful and fulfilling life, there's none but one choice to accept the responsibility of changing them. I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa when I was four years old, and I lost my sight gradually over the course of the last 20 years. Doctors informed my parents that I would probably go blind by the time I'm 40 or even 50, and that, that I would go through college and school without much trouble. But as it happened, they weren't exactly right. And by the time I was eight, I couldn't read print books, and I couldn't see the writings on the blackboard. And by the time I started college, I could no longer see myself in the mirror. At every turn and step in my life, I was confronted with one decision, whether to accept the excuses made for me and live in easy self-pity, or to brace myself and walk into the unknown. I always chose the latter. I studied at the special, special School for the Blind in Mongolia and graduated in 2000. And at that time, that was as far as most blind people went in terms of education. The accepted norm was either to go work at a special factory or go stay at home. But I didn't want to follow the norm. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to have a good job. And I wanted to make my parents and my family proud of me. And this meant that I had to work twice as strong and be, twi you know, to be, be twice as hardworking as anybody else. Um, up until I was 14, I was just like any other child. I didn't know that I would eventually go blind. I thought that I just had a really bad eyesight. And the, the extent of the impact of my condition on my life was the occasional name calling caused by, by my thick glasses or, or the fact that I read differently than, than, than others. Um, but when I reached 14, 
I learned the true nature of my condition. And since then, life became a race for me. I couldn't imagine living life without being able to see. I thought going blind would mean the end of everything. And suddenly I realized why all those years ago my father took me to all those museums. I was eight at the time, and uh, the museums were either boring or scary to me. But then I understood that, you know, he, he, he obviously wanted me to have some memory of the cultural value and history of our country. So, you know, I, 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 remember, I remember the sudden feeling of panic as I realized how, how much for me there was to see and learn and how, how little time there was. I, I started looking for books to read. You know, I, I, I thought books were my only salvation. And, uh, you know, I remember sitting in, in my school's dorm room and, and reading and reading without pause as if my life depended on it. And within three weeks, I had read all the braille books that were available in Mongolian language at our school. I worked with the same zealousness on my other subjects. I wanted to cram as much knowledge as I could into my head so that I could be ready when blindness came. I wanted to prepare myself. Unfortunately, there, wasn't, there weren't much resources at our school. And soon I grew frustrated by the lack of, well, pretty much everything. But I was determined, and the lack of resources didn't deter me much. If anything, you know, it, it, it just made me look for other options. For example, when I r realized that I, had all the, that I had read all the books at our school, I found out that they were donated English Braille books. So what did I do? I set out to learn English. Of course, we didn't have any English teachers or English teaching materials or, or English books, you know, um, which naturally didn't deter me. <laughs> so after finishing my special school, I went to study at a regular high school with normal-sided children um, because I wanted to go to college. And in order to go to college, we had to have 10 years of higher education. Again, it was a challenge because nobody knew how to teach a blind student or how to handle a blind student. I remember being told off on the first day of school for disrupting the lesson by punching holes in my notebook, which was the process of taking notes in Braille. But I overcame my fears and my, my embarrassments I refused to be the prisoner of my disability. In 2006, I graduated from the University of the Humanities. In 2007, I became the first blind Mongolian to receive the Fulbright Scholarship. In 2009, I received my master's degree in library and information science from the Louisiana State University, and I returned home with the very first guide dog of Mongolia. <laughs> I never had a single book in audio format, or, or I, I, I never had enough books in Braille as I was going through school and college in Mongolia. I never had enough Braille paper to take notes so that I often had to memorize as much as I could and note down the only, only the most important. And as difficult as the, the lack of material resources was, it was nothing compared to the, the social ignorance that I had to deal with. It was the only thing that halted me in my track. 
I was once asked by a journalist, what was the most difficult thing in life for me? And I said it was not being able to contribute. Because I believe every human feeling and every human skill finds meaning only when shared. And I think the biggest human tragedy is not being allowed to share what one has to offer with one's community. Imagine not being able to contribute when you're bursting with knowledge and energy. Imagine being treated like a small child when you're a perfectly capable adult. Imagine people not seeing you for who you are, but only seeing your disability. Lack of understanding and unawareness is the foundation for any discrimination and misunderstanding. And they are far more consequential than lack of material resources. Because it's one thing when you go hungry just because there's no food. But it's a very different thing if you go hungry because people don't see it as a problem that you don't have food. Material resources can change everything alone because they are just the tools. Social understanding and acceptance are the hands that put these tools into motion. From, from a personal point of view, I come a long way. But from a perspective of a capable young person and a re representative of a socially disadvantaged group, I have a very long way to go. From my experience so far, I've come to understand that if one wants to see a meaningful social change, individual success is not all and it's not enough, but it can be the beginning. In the past 20 years, I've lost much, but I've learned a lot. I've learned that going blind is not the end of everything. I've learned that you might not be able to control what life might throw at you, but you have the incredible power of choosing how to react to it. And that makes all the difference in the world. In the words of Helen Keller, when one door closes, we look at it so regretfully, we don't notice another one opening. So don't just see life, experience it. Because life is too rich to be seen only. So I hope that you, as open-minded you know, citizens of this, this diverse world, who believe in social justice and democracy, will join me in extending your hand to a disabled person, not out of pity, but out of understanding and acceptance. Thank you.